Good morning. Welcome to the Fort Bragg SDA Church. Uh, my name is Caleb Henry. I'm pastor of the Fort Bragg, Willits, and Covalo Seventh Avenue churches. Happy to have you here today. Uh, and as we are navigating this uh, this time, I know it's so good to uh, come together. And I encourage you, as you're listening to this, uh, to be thinking about okay. How, how does this apply to my life? And then maybe even be texting members um, afterwards about, okay, like, what, what do you think of this? Uh, how should we live this out? Uh, so just because you're not able to talk after the service, we still encourage you to come to there. Uh, we also have it on uh, QR code. If you want to just point your smartphone camera at this, uh, you'll be taken to the giving site. Uh, so this is the Fort Bragg one, and Willits is this one. So just take a look there, go, go to that site, and we'd love to have you just join in with us. Um, you know, as for those of you who get the, the weekly email, uh, the newsletter, you know that we really highlighted that where your treasure is, there your, there your heart will be also. And so we don't care at all about how much treasure you feel like God's calling you to give, um, I don't know that number. It's totally fine, whatever. It's between you and God. But we want your heart. We want our hearts to be together during this time. So I encourage you to set up an account and, and to be giving, giving there. Now, one of the cool things about streaming is that today in our service, we have people from every church, uh, from here in Fort Bragg, from Willits and Covelo involved. So now I'd like you uh, to pray, and then we're going to have uh, special music uh, from uh, Oli and Mina Numelin uh, from the Kovalo SDA Church. Let's pray together. And Jesus, we thank you for being with us. We thank you for your love for us, and that even as we're apart, that as we des desire to come together, you meet with us. So Jesus, we're here today to meet with you. We pray that you would open our minds to understand spiritual things. And we pray for Dean that you'd be leading and guiding him. I thank you, Lord, and I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Wasn't that a beautiful song? Thank you so much, uh, Kovalo, uh, for the beautiful music that you provided uh, today for this worship service. Uh, before we get uh, into the sermon, I would like to have um, some prayer time. I know that a lot of people are going through a lot of difficult things in life, and, uh, and as we see around in the United States, what was it, like 26 million people out of work, so I'm sure that it's impacted some of you. So let's Let's spend a little time in prayer because God has all the answers. I know, I know I don't. So I'm going to kneel here for, for prayer. Father in heaven, we just uh, want to exalt you. We just love you. We want to serve you for who you are. you are. You created us, and you sent your son down, Jesus, to to die on the cross for each one of us. And we're not worthy at all of that. But it... Uh, we have mixed emotions. It's sadness because of sin, what it did, but we also have joy for what, how much you truly love us. And Lord, there are people around that are, that are struggling, not only in our churches, but in the community. And this is a very difficult time right now. And I pray, Lord, that uh, this will be a time that uh, you flood their hearts and minds with peace that uh, help them to to uh, rely upon you, to hold on to you during this um, storm that's going on presently. And uh, there are people that are watching or have family that, have, um, that are struggling with illnesses, health, health issues. Lord, you're the great healer. And that's what we need more than anything else. And, and if you were here right now, we just wanted to touch the hem of your garment so that virtue and that the, the healing properties would come out of you. Lord, we all need healing, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. So, Lord, today, I just pray that you will um, bless Dean as, as he brings um, the word to each one of us, that, that uh, we could learn more about how we could commune with you and spend time with you. And to, and to love you. And we thank you for answering all these prayers. And Lord, I just also pray in the Spirit, and we pray in the merits of the precious blood of Jesus, who died on Calvary's cross. And we ask for the Holy Spirit to minister to each one of us. And we thank you for this and answering our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have a blessing um, as, a, as a younger pastor. Uh, I have the blessing of having three quality head elders that I get to work with. And today you're going to be hearing from the head elder here at the Fort Bragg SDA Church. Uh, his name is Dean Jennings. And uh, we call him many titles. Uh, he is known here uh, as a father, uh, an elder, a doctor, a, a spouse. Um, you have so many titles and ways that he has blessed the people of our church. Um, so, Dean, thank you for your passion, for your walk with the Lord, and for sharing with us today. Good morning. We're so happy to be in this sanctuary this morning, worshiping God. We look forward to Sabbath all week long, and now we're here. We are asking the Holy Spirit and the angels of God to be with us this morning as we commune with God. I was asked to uh, speak on the general subject of communing with Almighty God based on a chapter in Steps to Christ known as the privilege of prayer. I was also asked to intersperse the thoughts from this chapter with some of my own experience that I've had in life, and that goes way back to when I was about five years old. So we'll begin this morning with uh, a few comments from those early years, and then we'll get right into the excerpts from Steps to Christ on communing with God in prayer, communing with Almighty God, and then we will go through this with comments periodically from my own life and how it has influenced me. So I was five to six years old, 
And uh, every Sabbath, my parents would, uh, of course, go to church and Sabbath school. And I would be down in the, the little room with the, the youngsters, five, six years of age. And I well remember these visions are, of this time are fixed in my mind, the picture rolls of that time. They had picture rolls, large rolls. They were about two feet wide and three feet long, and they, they talked incessantly week after week after week about the mission field, the far-flung mission field of the Adventist church all over this earth. And my little heart, I tell you at the time, was just pounding rapidly as I saw those pictures from Africa, from South America, from all over the world. And I determined right then five, six-year-old kid that I had to someday go. I just had to. It was planted in my heart, in my mind. I just had to go to the mission field someday. And I was communing with God. At the time, I didn't realize what I was doing, but I was actually communing with Almighty God. Then another heavy influence in my heart and life at the time was my father, who worked six days a week, about 12 hours a day, worked very hard, um, he would, on Friday nights, gather us in the front room there, would read from church papers like the Review and Herald, and again, it was things about the mission field, and that stuck with me to this very day, remembering my father reading. I remember he had a hard time pronouncing Seoul, Korea. We've been in Seoul, Korea since then, but uh, he would call it Seoul, Korea. I remember those words, Seoul, Korea. Uh, and also, early influence on me was my lay preacher father. He, uh, I don't know how on earth he prepared his sermons because he worked six days a week, many long hours. But he would, he would preach in the small churches all around Longview, Washington. There were uh, just a host of small churches, and they didn't have a pastor. So they called him to do the preaching, and I would go with him. And I remember how nervous I was going to these strange churches. Didn't know a soul. And I just never forget getting sweaty palms and red ears and just nervous as all get out. I just couldn't, I just remember that so well. But I, watching my father up there preaching was also indelibly impressed on my mind. Um, now I'm 12 to 15 years old and uh, I remember vividly, I don't know where this came from, I have no idea except it must have been from communing with God that I didn't realize what was happening. Uh, the Review and Herald would come to our mailbox, Longview, Washington, there every Thursday. And I couldn't wait for the Review to come because I had developed an attachment with somebody known as Francis David Nickel. He was the editor of the Review and Herald. And I would literally run to the mailbox when the mailman left and realizing that the Review would be there and every Thursday and never disappointed me. And I would tear that paper open and go to the editorial section and read those brilliant editorials that he would write. And uh, that's indelibly impressed on me as well as I think back on those years. I just loved the man. I never was able to meet him in person, but I do think and I do believe I'll meet him one day in the earth made new. Um, then there was the, <laughs> I'll call him my friend because I've met him and talked to him a number of times, HMS Senior, HMS Richards. Crystal radio set, a little crystal radio set. And I never forgot how I could learn to bring in the voice of prophecy on a certain spot on that little crystal, put the little copper wire there, and uh, I could bring in the voice of prophecy every week hear those melodious words from him. Jesus, hearing the quartet singing, Jesus is coming again, and hear his voice and near to the heart of God. Uh, every week, I just long for those words to hear those again. So those were impressions that just left lasting impressions on me. And again, at the time, I didn't realize what the words meant, but I was really communing with the Almighty. And they were buried, these memories were buried deep in my soul. Um, so let's now go and we'll come later to some more experiences of my life where we were communing with the Lord 
But let's go to the chapter on communing with the Almighty God from the steps to Christ. It's, it's an incredible chapter and well worth our time this morning as we wait before the Lord here. So it starts off the pointing out that through nature and revelation and through providence and by the influence of the Holy Spirit, by the way, that's the only way we learn anything from Scripture is but the Holy Spirit guiding us. That's the only way it works. But this is not enough, she writes. This is not enough. She penned these words. We must have an actual relationship with our Heavenly Father. Now, back in those early years, I really had no idea what those words meant. Later in life, when we returned from the mission field, I was to learn in a very deep way what those words meant. We must have. And by the way, I'm always interested in Scripture and Ellen White's writings where there's an absolute phrase or word. Absolute. And here we have one of those, must have. We must have this relationship with the Heavenly Father if we're to one day enter the streets of the New Jerusalem. So we have these all-inclusive words and phrases all through this chapter. Uh, we must have this. H, uh, Maury Venden was a friend of ours, and he, his whole life sermon, series of sermons, hundreds of them, was all based around this relationship question. He wrote books about it, relationship with Jesus. Left a heavy impression on me. We must have something to say to him concerning our actual life. It can't be theory, according to her. It must be something that's absolute, that, 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 that helps us in the here and now. It can't be something that's just theoretical. Then she has this famous line that every Christian that's read her books knows. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as a friend. My, oh my. What a statement that is. It's like you're opening your very deepest part of your heart to God as though he's actually a friend. Just like you'd sit down with a longtime friend and discuss something. That's how we need to do this with communing with the Almighty. And then she has another line that's well known to so many people. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but it brings us up to him. Another concept for us to always remember as we're communing with the Almighty God. When Jesus was on earth, she pins, he taught his disciples how to pray. He directed them to present their daily needs before God. Underline daily. What we did the day before isn't good enough for the next day. What I did yesterday isn't good enough for today. We must have a daily experience and relationship with Jesus. And then she pens these words, to cast all our care upon him. Another all-inclusive word, all our care on him. With the assurance he gave them that their petitions would be heard. And that's also assurance to us that our petitions will be heard. Jesus himself, when he dwelled among men, was often in prayer. Our Savior identified himself with our needs and our weaknesses. What a beautiful thought that is. In that he became a suppliant, a petitioner, seeking from his Father. Here we have the theme again, fresh supplies of grace and strength. Fresh supplies on a daily basis. That's very key. What happened yesterday is wonderful, but it's not good enough for today. His humanity made prayer a necessity and a privilege. He found comfort and joy in communion with his Father. Comfort and joy. We need to find ourselves there as well. And if the Savior of men, the Son of God, felt the need of prayer, how much more should feeble, sinful, moral people feel the necessities of fervent, constant prayer. Now the Bible tells us we must always constantly be in prayer. Well, we, that has to be understood. I think it has to, I think really what it's saying is you have to be where you can always be in an attitude that you could pray. You pray often, but you always have to be where you could pray in any moment. Our Heavenly Father waits to bestow upon us the fullness of His blessing. What a wonder it is that we pray so little, she writes. 
God is ready and willing to hear the sincere prayer of the humblest of his children. You know, when I read that preparing for this week here, I thought that there's going to be many surprises in heaven, many, many surprises. God is ready and willing to hear the sincere prayer of the humblest of his children. What can the angels of heaven think of poor, helpless human beings who are subject to temptation when God's heart of infinite love yearns toward them, ready to give them more than they ask or think? And yet they pray so little and have so little faith. What a statement that is, comparing our need to the angels of heaven. Then we have these words, the darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. Another all-inclusive statement, a affirmative statement that just says what it says. The darkness of the evil one encloses those who neglect to pray. The whispered temptations of the enemy entice them to sin, and it is all because they do not make use of the privileges that God has given them in the divine appointment of prayer. Why should the sons and daughters of God be reluctant to pray? And here's another famous statement that every Christian who reads her writings knows. When prayer is the key in the hand of faith that unlocks heaven's storehouse where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence. We just must read that again. Prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse. Heaven's storehouse? My, oh my. Where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence. The adversary, on the other hand, seeks continually to obstruct the way to the mercy seat that we may not by earnest supplication and faith obtain grace and power to resist temptation. Oh yes, he's always there. There are certain conditions upon which we may expect God will hear and answer our prayer. Now here's some vital points that we all should understand. First of all, we must feel the need of help from our Savior. We must feel the need, number one. I was reminded when I read that back in the Old Testament, Moses, Aaron, his brother, Joshua, many times the Old Testament, just been reading in Patriarchs and Prophets recently through that book, and over and over again, they literally fell on their faces in the dirt when the people of Israel had sinned, the grave sin, and Moses had to come before God to ask forgiveness for the people. He would fall on the ground on his face in the dirt. Yeah. So we need to feel our need of helplessness and our need from him. That's number one. Number two, we cannot, if we expect him to answer our prayer, we cannot regard iniquity in our hearts. Doesn't work. Can't regard iniquity. And we cannot cling to any known sin. So there are some parameters here that we need to keep in mind. We cannot cling to any known sin. This is another all-inclusive. These are all-inclusive statements that we need to understand. And then thirdly, when all wrongs are righted, if we have something that's on our conscience, we need to have all wrongs righted. Fourthly, our own merit will never commend us to the favor of God. Basic Adventist theology right there. Our own merit will never commend us to the favor of God. It is the worthiness of Jesus that will save us. That was brought out in the Sabbath school this morning. It is the worthiness of Jesus that will save us. His blood that will cleanse us. Yet we have a work to do in complying with the conditions of acceptance. Another element in prevailing prayer is faith. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That beautiful text from Hebrews 11, 6. Jesus said to his disciples, What things soever ye desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Do we take him at his word? I'm going to go back to my experience for just a moment or two now. Now we're in the academy years and went to Columbia Academy and 
found a beautiful girl there that seemed to accept me with my big ears and all the rest of it. And uh, her name was Mona. And uh, she also had this desire and this desire to go to a foreign mission field one day. So as we advanced on through college and medical school, we did not lose this mission concept, this mission that had been in my heart since I was five years old. The General Conference found out about my interest in overseas mission appointment when I was in medical school and they literally pounced on me. I certainly was communing with the Almighty at that time. So I signed up for overseas mission appointment. Then the unbelievable unexpected happened. I received a letter in the mail from my draft board from Longview, Washington. How they found where I lived, I have no idea on this earth. But they found me, and they sent me a letter. And it wasn't a very pleasant letter. It was, greetings. You've, you are hereby informed that you're going to be drafted into the armed forces of the United States of America. And my heart sank. I had just signed up for overseas mission that I'd wanted since I was five years old. Well, in the letter, they had a phone number there. Longview, Washington, phone number. So I called the lever. By this time, I was literally trembling and communing with God, communing with the Almighty at that time. And so I uh, opened the letter, called the phone number, and I said, I realize what you've sent me, but I said, I've just been appointed to an overseas mission appointment for five years to the Bangkok Adventist Hospital. And the rest of my entire life, I'll never forget the next words that he said to me, that captain on the phone. Oh my, he said, your hospital, Bangkok Hospital, he said, I've been there. He said, that's a wonderful place. That's a wonderful hospital, he said. You're going to do more good in that hospital than you're going to do in my army. He said, you have a five-year deferment. Let me tell you, I had some communing with the Almighty at that point. And uh, so we were then free to go to Bangkok, which was my life work at that point. The five-year-old had come full, full circle, full, full circle. So let's leave my personal story and go on with uh, some of these incredible concepts from the Steps to Christ article, and we'll come back to my story in a few moments. When do we, when we do not receive the very things we ask for at the time we ask, we are still to believe that the Lord hears and that he will answer our prayers. Now, what kind of human emotion does that bring up to you? You, you, you have something that you feel the Lord wants to happen. Sometimes you, you're overwhelmed by your own emotions trying to tell the Lord what he should do. That's sort of a human equation there that's not very good. I've been there a few times. However, um, we need to keep something in mind. And I want to bring up now an experience we had at Redwood Camp meeting a few years ago. Kathy Maurer came to town there at the camp meeting. And uh, I usually get the bulletin and search through it frantically, trying to pick out the, the real spiritual things that I really must not miss. And I discovered that she was going to talk about prayer. About prayer. Well, that's interesting, I thought. I, I want to go to that one. So it was in a little white tent, a little white tent on the campground. And... Uh, it's only about 15 chairs in there, and I thought, my, this, this is sad because there's people milling all over the place, going by on the roads all over the place, and laughing, talking, having a great time. Nothing wrong with that, a camp meeting. It's a joyful time. But there's only 15 people in this little white tent. And Kathy Maurer gave one of the greatest discussions on prayer I've ever heard in my life. It was such a beautiful thing. And the three things I've taken away from that that are going to do me the rest of my life are, she said, and it's biblical, biblically sound. Sometimes God answers prayer right now. Yeah, right now. Sometimes he says, wait a while. But I love the third one. 
He says, I have something better in mind. That one really appeals to me. I have something better in mind than you even dreamed about. Remember our thoughts, his thoughts are higher than the heavens are above the earth, according to the Bible? Yes. So sometimes the answer is prayer right now. Sometimes wait a while, testing my faith. But then the third one, I love. I have a better thing in mind. Yeah. But to claim, she writes, that prayer will always be answered in the very way for which a particular thing that we desire is presumption. And then she writes these beautiful words, God is too wise to err and too good to withhold any good thing from them that walk uprightly. Then do not fear to trust him, even though you do not see the immediate answer to your prayers. Rely upon his sure promise. Ask, and it shall be given you. Ask, and it shall be given you. Jesus' words from Scripture. If we take counsel with our doubts and fears or try to solve everything we cannot see clearly before we have faith, perplexities will only increase and deepen. She next writes, through sincere prayer, we are brought into connection. Can you believe this? Through sincere prayer, we are brought into connection with the mind of the infinite. Wow. Through sincere prayer, we are brought into the connection with the mind of the infinite. We may have no remarkable evidence at the time that the face of our Redeemer is bending over us in compassion and love, but this is even so. We may not feel his visible touch, but his hand is upon us in love and pitying tenderness. What a beautiful thought. Perseverance in prayer is another key factor has been made a condition of receiving. This is interesting to me. Perseverance. You don't pray flippantly or one time and then... I've done that, I'm through with that. No, perseverance in prayer has been made a condition of receiving. Here's another all absolute statement again. I love these absolutes. We must pray always if we would grow in faith and experience. We are to be, quote, instant in prayer, Romans 12, 12, and watch in the name, same with thanksgiving, Colossians 4, 2. Peter also tells us, be sober and watch unto prayer. 1 Peter 4, 7. Unceasing prayer is the unbroken union of the soul with God. So always be in a situation where you could pray at a moment's notice. Don't ever place yourself someplace where the angels of God can't go with you on that journey. Prayer that we're talking of is that life from God flows into your life. And from our life, purity and holiness flow back to him and to other people. There's the way it works. There's necessity for diligence in prayer. Let nothing hinder you. Make every effort to keep open the communion between Jesus and your own soul. Seek every opportunity to go where prayer is want to be made. Those who are seeking, really seeking for communion with God will be seen in the prayer meeting. We should pray in the family circle. We must not neglect secret prayer, for this is the life of the soul. She says these words, secret prayer is the life of the soul. It is impossible for the soul to flourish where prayer is neglected. Another all-inclusive absolute statement. It is impossible for the soul to flourish where prayer is neglected. By calm, simple faith, the soul holds communion with God and gathers to itself rays of divine light to strengthen and sustain it in its conflict with Satan, the great adversary, the dragon. God is our tower of strength. Pray in your closet. Pray as you go about your daily labor. Let your heart be often uplifted to God. It was thus that Enoch walked with God. These silent prayers rise like precious incense before the throne of grace. 
Satan cannot overcome him. Here's another absolute statement, folks. Satan cannot overcome him whose heart is thus stayed on God. There is no time or place which is inappropriate to offer up a petition to God. There's nothing that can prevent us from lifting up our hearts to this spirit of the earnest prayer. In the crowds of the street, in the midst of a business engagement, a closet communion may be found wherever we are. We should have the door of the heart open continually and our invitation going up that Jesus may come and abide as a heavenly guest in the soul. Let's just repeat that one. Jesus may come and abide as a heavenly guest in our soul. We may live in the pure atmosphere of heaven. We may close every door to impure imaginings and unholy thoughts by lifting the soul into the presence of God through sincere prayer. Those whose hearts are open to receive the blessing of God will be in constant communion with heaven. What a place to be, friends. What a place to be. Let the soul be drawn out and upward that God may ground us a breath of the heavenly atmosphere. We may keep so near to God that in every unexpected trial, here's a, here's, a, here's a real thought for us, our thoughts will turn to him as naturally as the flower turns to the sun. How many times have you witnessed that? The gardeners and others that just briefly know about agriculture and the flowers. You notice that the flowers literally do turn towards the sun. I've seen it a hundred times. Keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows before him. You cannot burden him. You cannot weary him. He who numbers the hairs of your head is not indifferent to the wants of his children. The Lord is pitiful and of tender mercy, James 5.11. The heart of love is touched by our sorrows and even by our utterances of them. The relationship with God, now here's another statement that everybody that knows this book, Steps to Christ, is familiar with. The relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care. Not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. Isn't that something? Jesus said, Ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you. Jesus here identifies the fact that they're both one, one in the object of saving humanity and earth's children. Well, back to my story briefly. So we arrived in Bangkok. I was welcomed in Bangkok <laughs> with an interesting welcome. I think there was a mosquito who knew I was coming and he met me at the airport and I think he followed the car all the way to the compound, Bangkok Adventist Hospital compound, and he waited outside my front door for just the moment I could come out where he could get me. And he got me and I came down with dengue fever. And if any of you have ever had dengue fever, I don't have to tell you anymore because you know all about it. But its nickname is called break bone fever and you literally think every bone in your body is broken. It feels that bad, I tell you for sure. Then you have 103, 104 temperature, and it was just absolutely quite a welcome to Bangkok Adventist Hospital for me. And it just happened that the mosquito dis decided that he would get me on the, the night that they were gonna have our welcoming party for our family arriving in the mission field. So I was in on the bed with a high fever and you also get depressed. It's a strange thing. I, I don't get depressed, but I got depressed then, and, and you, just, you just literally want to die. It's a weird thing that virus does to you. Uh, laying with a high temperature, break bone fever, and you just, you just want to die. It's just awful. Very strange phenomenon that that disease gives you. And so they were all having a great time out in the front there, and I was in the bedroom just laying there. Uh, while they were having a great time. That's how I was welcomed to Bangkok. 
We had some other illnesses, you know. Missionaries get diseases too. Our daughter Pam got malaria when we were out there. One of our main crises situations was we had been, once in a while missionaries get to go on vacations. I don't know how we did it on $1,200 a month salary out there, but we somehow made it. I just have no idea how we did it to this day. But anyway, we went to Indonesia and on our way back, we stopped in Singapore, and then we were driving our Volkswagen hatchback up the country of Malaysia, but it was, it was coming to the weekend, so the missionaries in Singapore, that's where the division headquarters were, they had a special vacation spot that they had just about a half an hour, an hour north of Singapore headquarters where missionaries went for weekend recovery and stuff like that. So they let us stay there. But Friday night we stopped there expecting to have a nice f Sabbath time there with, with our families and the Lambeth family and so on. And uh, our little boy Reg was five years old. He started vomiting Friday night. Vomited all night long. And I had no idea whether I should go back to the Singapore hospital or try to go north towards Bandung, Malaysia. By morning at 5 a.m., I knew we had to get someplace quick because he was, he was in trouble. He, through the whole ordeal, he lost five pounds and he was just a five-year-old boy. And I put him on my lap. I'll never forget this drive. All the way up Malaysia for about six-hour drive on my lap, vomiting, so we could drive into the Bandung Adventist Hospital. I was never so happy to see a hospital in my lifetime. He was so dehydrated they couldn't find an IV in his arm or in his vein, so they just stuck a needle right in his leg muscle, started putting IV fluids in there and saved his life. But that's how we uh, have some experiences in the mission field that were unexpected. Um, so let's go back to our main source of inspiration this morning, we may be daily learning more of our Heavenly Father, gaining a fresh experience of His grace. Now we're back to that theme that we have to have something daily. What happened yesterday was a great experience, but it's not good enough for today. So it's a daily experience of grace. It should be the most natural thing in the world to make Him first in all our thoughts every morning when we wake up to talk of his goodness and tell of his power. She writes some amazing things in this chapter. Now, let us raise our eyes. She pens further. Let us raise our eyes to the open door of the sanctuary above where the light of the glory of God shines in the face of Christ who's able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. That verse, Hebrews 7.25, certainly is appropriate for the next portion of my story. One of the greatest moments in all of the time we spent out there, the hospital in Bangkok has a large nursing school of 100 students, and they have freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and they have about 25 in each class. And uh, we sponsored one of those classes. In any event, Every so often, now the majority of these girls come from all parts of Thailand and they're Buddhists. Buddhists coming to the Adventist nursing school there. But some of the greatest moments we can remember is when one of the Buddhist nurses decided they wanted to be a Christian and the baptism would take place. Just a beautiful, beautiful occasion. There were tears in the heart and tears in the eyes when we witnessed those events. Yeah. We still are in contact with these people to this day. Once you make a friend and they trust you, they're your friends for life. We have many of our nurse friends that are down in Southern California. They keep in touch with Mona, especially in her critical illnesses she's had. Some came all the way from Thailand just to visit her. It was an amazing experience, amazing. Back to some words of amazement. We must gather about the cross Christ, him crucified, should be the theme of contemplation, of conversation, and of our most joyful emotion. We should keep in our thoughts 
every blessing we receive from God. And when we realize his great love, we should be willing to trust. Are you ready? Another absolute, all-inclusive statement. When we realize his great love, we must be willing to trust everything to the hand that was nailed to the cross for us. The question comes to each one of us today, are we ready to trust everything to the hand that was nailed to the cross for you and for me? The soul may ascend nearer heaven on the wings of praise. God is worshiped with song and music in the courts above. And as we express our gratitude, we are approximating to the worship of the heavenly host. Let us with reverent joy come before our Creator with thanksgiving and with the voice of melody. Another, back to some communing with God experiences out in Thailand when we first got there, I quickly discovered that they did not have a church paper of any kind. At a publishing house, they published some books, but it was no church paper. There was no little friend. There was no youth instructor equivalent. There was no uh, Review and Herald, there was no Signs of the Times, nothing like that. So it just so happened that we had what I call a divine appointment. When we got there, we were given um, a Thai teacher to help us with the language. And so we were assigned to Kru Mei, Kru meaning the Thai word for teacher, and Mei was her name, Kru Mei. A beautiful lady um, in all respects. She, she was a Baptist, spoke perfect English, and of course Thai, because she was Thai. And so we got the idea, it was God did this thing, but we got the idea that the Thai has got to have some paper. They've just got to have a, a children's paper, and they've got to have an adult paper. We've got to have the equivalent of a Thai Review and Herald and the equivalent of a, of a, of a children's paper. So I got the idea to have her translate things into the Thai language from some of HMS Richard's writings, Ellen White's writings, and so on. And so we gathered all kinds of things together, and she would translate them, and then I'd take it to the printing house. So we had a monthly Thai paper that came out for adults and for children. So those were some of the exciting things that we, we experienced. Um, and so I think I consider that a divine appointment that she was just happened to be assigned to us so that we could then use her for the Lord's work. And uh, I think the paper is still, still going in Thailand to this day from those early days. Um, some of the text that comes to mind as we, as we are closing here and thinking of our theme uh, communing with the Almighty God. Jesus said, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Through the scriptures, he tells us. Also from Hebrews, let us come boldly under the throne of grace. Boldly under the throne of grace. From 2 Corinthians 3.18, we have the theme that it really tells us that by beholding, we become changed. These words of Scripture have, mo have really deep meaning when we think of communing with the Almighty. Communing with the Almighty, we can have a fresh vision of some of these texts of Scripture that help us along our pathway to the kingdom. And so in closing, thinking of communing with the Almighty, the song, recent song, fairly recent, with these beautiful words, to close. I have fixed my mind on another time and here I mean to stand until God gives me more light. And that is today, today, today until he comes. I've fixed my mind on another time, on another time. I've set my course on the narrow way, on the narrow way. For I know that time is close at hand for which I watch and pray. That is today until he comes. I've set my course on the narrow way, on the narrow way. Even so, Lord, come quickly. This is my fervent prayer. For I've caught a glimpse of glory and I'm longing to be there. 
When shall the Son of Man appear? The trumpet sounds its blast, and Christ descends glorious fire with all the saints amassed, will rise with those who sleep no more. Underline that one, those who sleep no more, to meet him in the air. How I long to meet my father and mother again. When shall the Son of Man appear? The Son of Man appear. Even so, Lord, come quickly. This is my fervent prayer. For I've caught a glimpse of glory. And oh, I'm longing to be there. Because I've fixed my mind on another time. Oh yes, I've fixed my mind on another time. Let's ask one last time for God to bless us this morning. Father in heaven, eternal Father, we thank you that you've left us the beautiful road map, the scriptures. So many have died that we might have these scriptures today. You've left it for us as our road map to the eternal kingdom. We're thankful for the beautiful writings of the messenger to our church who's given us these wonderful books, Desire of Ages, Steps to Christ, all these wonderful books, Great Controversy and others, that also enlarge the scriptures and help us to understand more fully what the scriptures mean. May we read them daily, Lord, receiving fresh supplies of grace as we've just learned from Steps to Christ, fresh supplies every day so that we can walk with you as Enoch walked and then one day when you come, Look up and say, Lo, this is my God. I've waited for him and he will save me. We can say it with assurance because you died for us and we've accepted that as our ticket to heaven. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.